Good morning, everybody. My name is Nikki, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Nikki. My sobriety date is February 6th of 2012, and I am profoundly grateful for that, as I am for the opportunity to be here with you guys today. I will tell you, um, when I was invited to speak, after I got over the initial shock, they told me I'd be speaking at 8.30 Saturday morning, and my reaction was, great, no one will be there. You know, I was like, there will be four people setting up chairs, getting coffee ready, and I can say whatever I want, and no one is going to listen. So, this is a lot of accountability. Um, <laughs> if, if my heart starts interfering with, like, background noise, just tell me to cool out, take a breath, we'll move forward. Um, but I really, I, this is a super cool experience. I've never had the experience of being up here at a podium, podium and looking out and seeing nothing but this sea of strong, beautiful, sober women. And it is so humbling and overwhelming. Thank you guys so much for getting out of bed earlier and for being here with me today. That, that empty room sounded appealing, but I have a feeling it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been nearly as good <laughs> in reality as it was in my head. Um, I, I, will be very careful not to tell you uh, a lot of my story and a lot of my drunk log and one that's, you know, because no one cares, uh, but, but also because I, my drunk log sucks. My story is so not fun. I'm always so happy when I get to talk about the steps and not just tell my story, because my story was really kind of sad <laughs> and boring. It was just, you know, a lot of me um, and it's, it's, I don't have any of y'all's fun stories about being chased by the cops and waking up in random, like none of that happened, none of that. It was, it was, God, what a snooze. I cannot believe I kept drinking for as long as I did. It was so, so not fun looking back. Um, but just to give you a little bit of context for what you're going to hear today, I will tell you a little bit about where I came from. And, uh, what I will tell you guys is that I was born into this, like, incredibly, loving, supportive, nurturing family. I had unconditional love demonstrated to me every single day of my life. So I was taught from a very early age. I mean, there, I will tell you with, with every ounce of honesty I can muster, there was not one day that I was not told that I was loved, that I was smart, that I was pretty and talented, that I could be anything and do anything that I wanted to. Those were the messages that I received from my earliest days. So I was shown from an early age um, how, how to show love, how to have relationships, how to demonstrate my feelings. And in spite of that, the end of that drug, drug log that I will not make you sit through is that the last several years of my drinking, I had constructed a world for myself that was so small that there was only room in it for me and a bottle, and that was it. That was all that was left. So how did I get from point A to point B? How does that happen? Um, I certainly didn't understand it. I don't think anyone in my life understood it. Nobody knew what had happened to me, like what had gone so terribly wrong. Um, well, the inventory steps, which are what we're going to talk about today, were a really important part of answering those questions. Um, and of course, you know, the inventory steps are the ones that, you know, every newcomer is super excited and rushes in to do, right? Um, no, like we all hate them. Um, I had built these up in my mind as being this, this incredible mountain to climb, like I could just never do it. You know, and what happens with a lot of our sponsees, right? I mean, I had this happen to me recently. We got to the third step. We said that prayer. I sent her off to work on her inventory. I have not heard back since, you know? Uh, I found out, like, three months later, she finally responded to a text and was like, yeah, I've been drinking. And I was like, oh, no, really? Um, I did not see that coming. Amazing. Um, so <clears throat> if anyone has ever seen me do the steps before, what I always do when I do the steps is I talk about the principle that goes with the steps. The reason I do this is because it has really helped codify for me the purpose of each of these steps. You hear it said all the time, the steps are in order for a reason. I think there are lots of reasons the steps are in the order they are, but one of the reasons that helps me to get clarity in my mind is because with each one of these steps, part of the work I'm doing is trying to acquire the next principle. I'm going to need that principle to move on to the next step. So they really are all foundational. So the principle that correlates to the fourth step, the fourth step says we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. The 
principle that goes with the fourth step is courage, okay? Um, so when I came in, um, I looked at, sorry? Oh, the principle that goes with the fourth step is courage. Uh, so courage is the principle that I'm trying to attain. I'm trying to embody as I go through this inventory process. So in, in one, two, and three, the principles that I was hoping to acquire were honesty, hope, and faith. And God knows I'm gonna need all three of those if I'm gonna start out on this inventory process, right? Because I took one look at that, made a searching and fearless moral inventory selves of ourselves. And I looked at my sponsor and said, well, I've never done anything fearlessly in my whole life and I'm not gonna start now. And she was like, great, do it scared, I don't care. <laughs> and I decided I hated her. Um, and, and, and we moved on from there. There were, I decided I hated her pretty routinely. That was nothing new, she was used to it by the end. Um, but what the book tells us, right, is, is after that third step, after we take that third step prayer, what the book says is next we launched out on a course of vigorous action. I do not know how there is so much debate on what launch means, but it means get to it. It does not mean sit around and think about this for six to 24 months, you know, and get your colored pens right so it's all lined out and beautiful. Um, but this is what we do, and I think we women are worse about this. I really do. We want to make it pretty. We want to make it look nice. We, like, need to have it make sense to us. You know, uh, my husband has shown me <laughs> one of his initial fourth steps. It's a disaster. It's chaos. I don't know how anyone made sense of it. It was done. You know, it was done, he's been sober for 23 years, something worked, right? Mine, I was on graph paper, you know, I was trying to line it out. And thank God my sponsor didn't tolerate any of that for me. Um, Cause she said, you know, you're gonna line out your resentments, uh, your fears, you know, she's telling me everything I'm gonna, and she said fears. And I said, oh, there is not enough ink or paper in the world to list all of my fears. That'll take forever. And she said, well, you have three weeks, so you better get going. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God. Um, fortunately though, it actually turned out to be a good thing. I was so scared of everything because that included her. So I did it. I, was, I did it. I was afraid she would leave me. And um, I, I did exactly what she said. And I'm so glad, so glad that I did. So here's the thing, the book says, our liquor was but a symptom. We had to get down to causes and conditions. Piece of cake. I could tell you all of the causes and conditions that made me drink. You know, it was, you know, well, you, you were a lot of it, and, you know, them, they did a lot of things, and, uh, you know, all my external circumstances drove me to drink because they made me feel feelings that I didn't care for one bit. But when my sponsor pressed me on that, it was like, okay, so what kind of feelings? What kind of things are making you drink? And it was like, well, you know, I get mad a lot. I'm mad. I was real mad when I came in here. My friend Robin likes to call me a little ball of bitter. That's what she described me as, and it was not, it was not too far off the mark. Um, so I'd say, you know, I'm, when I'm mad, I got to drink, because that kind of settles me down a little bit. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes I'm just real anxious. I'm nervous, so it helps settle my nerves then. And, you know, sometimes I'm really sad kind of perks me up and uh, you know and if I'm happy right that's how else do you celebrate at that point like if I had a good day I gotta celebrate that I've earned a drink at that point um, but you know sometimes I'm bored it passes the time like it, it I did not get <laughs> that like all the circumstances you can't say that they're all wildly different sometimes in direct contrast to one another but I drink over all of them and still blame the circumstance right at some point the common denominator is me. So what's going on with me? Um, I will tell you one other thing she told me that I found very helpful is to complete my fourth step without giving one single thought to my fifth step, my eighth step, or my ninth step. She said, if you can do your fourth step, just being as honest as you are capable of being, this is only between you and God. You can hold on to whatever you want to hold on to. You will do that at your own peril, but you can do it. You will always be in charge of how honest you want to be with me or with anybody else in, in the rooms or outside. But do this four step. God already knows. God already knows. Please, please put it on paper. Put it on paper. It will be harder for you to withhold later if you will get it out of your head and at least acknowledge it to God. So 
when I made my inventory, I did what most of us do. Started at the inner circle, right? Started with my family. There are a lot of women in this room. I think moms top a lot of our lists, you know? Um, so that's where I started. I started with my family. I worked my way outward at her suggestion. So like I said, I had this incredibly just loving, squishy, gooey family. You know, that's, that's what I came from. Were they perfect? Of course not. Did they make mistakes? You bet they did. You bet they did. But I can honestly say to y'all, there was not one day in my life, not one day in my life, that I doubted that I was loved. I doubted every single day whether or not I deserved to be. And I don't know why. I don't know why, in spite of being raised in that incredibly safe and secure environment, and I know there are so many people in this room and in all of our rooms who didn't have that experience. And if you didn't have that experience, I am so sorry, because you were robbed of that. But I had it, and I didn't know how to accept it. My earliest memories of my feelings, in spite of that great environment that I was gifted, are feeling scared, anxious, insecure and ashamed. Those are the feelings I consistently remember feeling no matter how much good stuff was coming in from the outside. I spent my whole life trying to earn what was being freely given to me, trying to convince myself that I was worthy of this. This manifested for me primarily in a lot of perfectionism, a lot. Um, it drove me, I had to be convinced somehow that I was worth any of this praise and attention that I was getting all the time. So um, that looked like I would, so my story was, my family told me all these things. My story in my head was, they have to say that. They have to say that, they're my family. They have to say that. I have come to learn from many, many people, but certainly from a lot of the people in AA, they did not have to say that. There are many, many families that feel no such obligation. They did not say that because they had to. You know, they said that because they wanted to. I just didn't know how to take it. Then I thought, <clears throat> uh, clearly they're telling me this because they expect me to do better. They expect me to do better. They want me to live up to this. They're putting all these expectations on me. They're making me carry all this weight. They obviously want me to be this great person that they know I'm not. And they're trying to trick me into doing it. So, um, I mean, I was just projecting. You know, I was little bitty. And I, there's absolutely no good thing that my brain cannot distort or destroy in a matter of seconds. I can just be off with it. Um, and that's what I made a habit of doing. So what that looked like growing up is I would try a new activity and if I were not immediately the best one at it, I quit right away because it felt embarrassing, felt like a failure right away. Uh, being a perfectionist just feels like failing spectacularly over and over and over again. Um, and that was kind of what I felt like all the time. It did not help that I am not particularly good at a lot of things. Like, I'm just, I was not, I'm not athletic. I'm not musical, I'm not artistic. Like, I've come to, to know that I have strengths, I have good things to offer, but they're not the kind of things you can like compete in, you know? So um, they're like very soft, mushy kind of talents. Uh, so it did not go well for me. It led to me constantly, it just, in my mind, I took all of that as further evidence that I was right that I was absolutely less than, not enough, um, that everybody else you know, had, the, had the playbook and knew what they were doing and I was just floundering and doing everything wrong. Um, and so I started trying to seek control and mastery wherever I possibly could. Um, and, and I sought more and more external validation, which is so funny because my family was giving it to me all the time, but I didn't believe that, so I sought it from outside. And if I got it from a teacher or a friend or a coach, guess what happened? It wasn't enough. It was never enough. I used people like I used drinking. I needed something from you to make me okay with me, and I couldn't get it. I couldn't get it. I was trying to use you to fill up that hole, just like I did with the alcohol, and it just didn't work, but I kept trying. You know, if you would just use the right words or say it in just the right way, 
I would believe you and then I could be okay with me as long as you were okay with me. So it manifested with a lot of people pleasing, a lot of kind of manipulative behavior to get you to think of me a certain way. Um, because maybe if you could think of me in this really good way, then maybe I could hop on board at some point. I don't know why I kept thinking it would work when it kept failing over and over and over again. But I chased it. Didn't stop me from chasing it. Um, so this got really pronounced once I started drinking. Um, I will tell you guys just um, a little bit about, you know, I started drinking. It is only in a room of Alcoholics Anonymous. That this, this, this is kind of funny, because I always say in AA meetings, I started drinking kind of late, because I was 18. I realized that's still underage. <laughs> But in a room full of AAs, people are like, Jesus, you were practically a grandmother. Like, what were you doing? <laughs> what on earth were you doing? But really, all throughout high school, I mean, man, I was committed because I was trying to be perfect. So it started off the way a lot of women in AA start off. First thing I tried to control, food, right? If I couldn't be the best at anything, I could be the skinniest. Um, I was at least going to do that. I didn't. I went to an all-girls high school. Eating disorders were rampant. I couldn't keep up with them, you know, I did, which then, of course, made me think, see, I can't do anything right. I can't even do this right. Um, so I would, in high school, you know, I was trying to be, I was really focused on being like the perfect whatever. So that meant uh, no partying, no drinking, no drugs, no smoking, no sex, like no fun. Just don't have any fun. Only trouble can come from it. Just stay away from it at all costs. And did and boy did I. I mean, I nailed that. So it was the summer between my senior year of high school and my freshman year of college. And my best friend's family was going to have like a family get together. And they were going to let us drink. We were going to spend the night with them. So it was going to be this totally controlled, safe environment. And her parents were kind enough to ask my parents, hey, here's what's going on. Would you be OK if we let the girls drink while they're with us? My mother's response to that was, that kid has needed a drink for 18 years. <laughs> and if you can get her to take one, we will owe you. So I ended up drinking that night with my best friend. And what I told myself in my head were all the terrible things that would happen if I drank, right? Because I'm a catastrophizer. I'm, I'm, um, I'm always imagining the worst case scenario. So I had told myself, you know, if I drank, terrible things would happen. You know, I would lose control. I would probably be humiliated. Uh, I could be, like, assaulted. I'd probably wind up in jail or pregnant or destroying my future or all of those things all at once. God only knows. But what actually ended up happening um, was that it was a pretty quiet, uneventful night. And the single most important thing that happened that night was that nothing really big happened that night. I was not one of those people who was blackout drunk my first time. I drank probably four or five wine coolers. I acted like an idiot. I had some fun, and nothing happened. Nothing happened. I woke up the next day with two realizations. One, um, I was not anxious that whole night. I had not felt anxious or scared once that whole night. Um, in spite of the fact that I was with my best friend and her family, who I'd been with for years and years and years, and I shouldn't have felt anxious with them anyway. I would have, because I'm hardwired for it, and that was my natural state of being. So the fact that I noticed that I hadn't felt anxious was the first thing. The second thought I had is, this does not go over well at all in a mixed room. Men look very confused when I say this. Y'all will get this. The second thing I realized was, oh my god, I didn't suck my stomach in all night. And on, and the first thing I thought about that was, I was horrified. Like, oh my God, they all saw me not sucking my stomach in all night. But the second thing was like, that was exhilarating. That was the most freedom I had ever known in my 18 years. That was the single greatest feeling of like, whoa. Um, you know, it blew my mind. So, um, that's, that's what happened. It was a very, very inconspicuous start to my drinking career. All I thought was, I didn't think I'm gonna do this every day for the rest of my life. I thought, wow, that was nice. This definitely has potential. Um, <laughs> and, and it took a little while for me to drink alcoholically. Not a real long time, not probably as long as it should have. Um, but I did hold it off for a while. So 
What happened when I started drinking, though, was that obviously that behavior started escalating, right? So I was starting to, I was becoming like the problem friend, you know, the one who we were going out. I was the reason we were getting kicked out of the bar. I fell down and broke a lot of stuff and embarrassed everybody. And so I was becoming the topic of conversation among my friends. Now, I was very comfortable being in the group of friends where we were talking about the other girl and all the dumb shit she did. Oh, sorry, the dumb stuff she did. I was not at all comfortable being the one that they were talking about. But I had already gotten to the point where I knew I could not control and enjoy my drinking. So it never entered my mind I need to cut back on my drinking. I decided that all these relationships were really far too difficult. They were really messing up my life. And I started backing off telling my friends, yeah, I'm not going to go out. You guys are right. You guys are right. I've been acting a little crazy. I'm just going to have a nice quiet night at home, read a book. Meanwhile, that started my very long career of drinking alone and keeping it my great big secret. And this was a secret that I was willing to protect at all costs. I was willing to give my life for it. Really, for all intents and purposes, I did give my life. I gave the life I had known so that I could maintain my drinking. That was the most important thing to me, and it became of greater and greater importance the more time went on. Um, the problem was that also resulted in me widening this gulf between the person I wanted you to think I was and the person I knew myself to be. And as those two people got further and further apart, that distress inside got bigger and bigger and bigger, and it needed more and more and more. Um, and all of that came out in the inventory, you know. Um, the, the 12 and 12 refers to the depressive type of alcoholic. We probably have a few of those in there, my friends. Um, and it describes this type as being the one who wallows in this messy bog, often taking a misshapen and painful pleasure out of it. Like, that was me. That was what I did. That was like my free time, my fun activity was just to sit around in shame and guilt and self-loathing and like revel in it. Um, and, and that's how I spent a lot of my time. So on my inventory, my sponsor made very clear I was to put myself on my resentment list. And that was the longest section of my inventory was all the stuff I was so mad at me for. All the stuff I was so disgusted by and ashamed of. Um, and my inner dialogue was just this constant, steady stream of beratement and self-flagellation. It was a, a constant criticism. It ran all the time. And I sort of wore that as a badge of pride early in recovery. Because once again, I was deciding I'm the judge, jury, and executioner when it comes to worthiness. And I had decided that's what I deserved. That's what I deserved, was this constant litany of insults um, and, and breaking my spirit down for all the bad things I had done. I was one of those people that the book talks about when they say, like, newcomers are sometimes shocked when we burst into merriment. You know, all the, I was that newcomer where y'all would be telling stories and meetings and laughing. And, like, my first thought was always, I cannot believe y'all are saying this out loud. We can hear you. You know, because I was, I was so ashamed of myself. I wasn't going to tell y'all anything about me. And I could not believe the things you were sharing out loud. I was, I was oh my God, how embarrassing. Um, but then everybody would laugh and I would get mad because I was still that little ball of bitter. And I would hear you guys laughing and my thought was, you know, I feel bad. You guys are saying you've done all these terrible things and you drank like I did and I feel so bad and you should feel bad too. Like how dare you not feel bad? Because I didn't understand. I didn't understand recovery. I didn't understand healing. I didn't, I, I, I couldn't possibly. That seemed so anathema to me, so different than anything I had ever known um, that I just couldn't get there. But all of that, all of that I came to find out was that pride in reverse. That was just my ego being so big, being so out of whack, so disproportionate. Um, that I couldn't, I couldn't see any other side. I couldn't have any reasoning applied. Um, I was just stuck in that. And I would have stayed stuck in that were it not for these steps. So I want to get back to that idea of courage, right? That it's, it is hard to look inside. That is the vigorous action the book is talking about. It's not physically demanding, you know. It doesn't care if you go, you know, for a spin class. It doesn't matter. It's vigorous because that is hard on us. That is working muscles that most of us have never, ever, ever worked before. I had no interest at in looking inside. 
you know, I'd be happy to tell any of y'all what's wrong with you. I would actually still be happy to do that if you'd like me to. I'm sure I can come up with something. Um, but I did not want to do that for myself, not one little bit. One of my very favorite quotes uh, is by Franklin Roosevelt. And what that quote says is, courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the assessment that something else is more important. The reason I love that quote, you know, is one of the, one of the sayings I've heard in here a lot and that I used to hang on to quite a bit, I, I really liked was that uh, you can't be in fear and in faith at the same time. And we all love our little AA sayings, and that one's great. You know, it's short, sweet, to the point, it has alliteration, it has everything we love about it. Here's the problem. To anyone who says you can't be in fear and in faith at the same time, I will say, watch me. You know, <laughs> there would have been a time where I would have said, hold my beer, but that no longer applies. So we're just gonna go with watch me. You absolutely can be in fear and in faith at the same time because courage does not mean that I am no longer in fear. Courage means that I am scared. It is my demonstration of faith that allows me to walk through that fear. That is what courage means. It doesn't take any bravery to do something that doesn't scare you. You know, I assure you, going to North Park doesn't require me to be brave. Um, you know, that is not scary. This was scary. So, courage is not the absence of fear. You can be in fear and in faith. That is what faith is. That is the best demonstration of faith I have. I am still that scared little girl. I am still scared of everything you guys can throw at me. I've learned how to walk through it. And I've decided against all odds, something I never thought I would say about myself, is that I am a courageous person. I can be a courageous person. I got that gift in here. The inventory was an important first step. So. When we, talk, when we talk about courage, right, the reason I say you're going to need each step to go on to the next one, if there was one step I needed courage for, it was that this step. So now I've made my inventory, right? I've got this list of crap. Oh, God, what a, what a bunch of crap. Um, and now it says we admit it to God, to ourselves, and to another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. Um, principle with this step is integrity. Um, my version of integrity as it applies to the fifth step is am I willing to be honest and authentic enough for my outsides to match my insides? That takes a lot of courage, right? If you had asked me when I first came in here, are you a person of integrity, I would not have batted an eye and I would have told you yes. Of course, I didn't know what integrity meant. I just knew that I had not been in jail and was not like stealing anything. Not like, I mean, I was stealing a lot of things, but not, not like valuable things, not monetary things. I, I don't know. So I would have said yes. I didn't do this at all. I didn't do this at all. I wanted you to think I was anything other than what I felt on the inside. I wanted that outside to be as different as I could possibly make it. I wanted to control exactly what you saw and what you thought and what your perceptions were of me. So when it came time to take this list that I've come up with and share it with a sponsor, this felt sadistic. I mean, I was just convinced this was you all, this was just going to be an exercise in humiliation. So. I had a vision in my head of the fifth step. Did any of y'all ever watch that show, Scared Straight? where they just had like convicts yelling at kids or whatever. That is kind of what I thought my fifth step was going to be like. I thought, this is where they break me down so they can build me back up. You know, that's, that is what's going to happen. Yeah, I was ready. I was ready. I was just ready to get called names um, and be told that my life was over. And um, I was really bracing for the worst. Fortunately, of course, that was not at all what happened. Um, a really a missed opportunity. I'm still thinking of doing that with one of my sponsors. I'm consider, we'll see, I'll let you know how it works. I'll let you know. She'll probably be up here one day talking to you like, oh, it was terrible, she was so mean. Um, so the purpose of this step is not humiliation, right? It, it says the whole purpose of this step, or the reason we need this step is frankly, just because with alcoholics, a solitary self-appraisal will always be insufficient. If me thinking about me were enough to get me sober, I would have been sober a long time ago because that's all I do. That is all I do left to my own devices is think about myself. God knows. So 
it is because a solitary self-appraisal is insufficient. I can't get out of my own narrative by myself. I simply can't. I'm going to read a little bit of the book to you. The re let me say, the reason I'm going to read this part of the book to you is, I will tell you guys, my first time through the book, my first time through those first 164 pages, I was a complete pain in the neck. I took just about every sentence and told my sponsor why it didn't apply to me uh, and how I was very different and didn't think I qualified and all of those things. Um, just, you know, I was wrong about all of them, obviously, but I, I made my points. Um, there were two sections of the big book that even my first time through, I absolutely could not dispute. One of those is the first two paragraphs on page 151 in a vision for you. The other one is on page 73 in the big book, and it is dealing with the fist up. And it says, more than most people, the alcoholic leads a double life. He is very much the actor. To the outer world, he presents his stage character. This is the one he likes his fellows to see. He wants to enjoy a certain reputation, but knows in his heart he doesn't deserve it. The inconsistency is made worse by the things he does on his sprees. Coming to his senses, he is revolted at certain episodes he vaguely remembers. These memories are a nightmare. He trembles to think someone might have observed him. As fast as he can, he pushes these memories far inside himself. He hopes they will never see the light of day. He is under constant fear and tension. That makes for more drinking. I read that even my first time through the big book. My face got red. My eyes filled up with tears. I felt like I had been caught. I felt like I had been completely exposed. I felt like I had been seen and like I was known and I had spent a lifetime of trying not to feel seen or known by anybody. And in those two paragraphs, I got my breath knocked out of me because I felt so exposed and so vulnerable and like, holy cow, how did they know, you know, how did they know that? Um, in the fifth step, it's very interesting in our book, right? Our whole book is relatively soft. It's, it's very, you know, our book is meant to be suggestive only. It's, there are not a lot of absolutes. They knew their audience. They were not trying to make this a preachy, dictatorial manual, right? But in the fifth step, the language is really, really strong. In the fifth step, it does not play around. It says, if I don't do this, I'm going to drink again. It calls this a life and death errand. I don't think they use this language because the fifth step is the most important step. I think they used it because they know we will not do this. We do not want to do this. This is terrifying to alcoholics to be honest and vulnerable and open with another human being. This feels like the, this was still taking my fist up that first time was the scariest step I've had to take. It was scarier than my amends. It was scarier than anything I had to do on this program was just sitting down and telling the truth. Terrified me. But that's the importance they place on it. It is a life and death errand. I will drink again. That's a promise. That's a promise. Um, so, my sponsor told me, she gave me a very strict time limit on doing my four step, said you get done what you get done, you'll think of more stuff later, we all do, it's fine, but you're going to get everything out that you can, and then when I was done, it was we are meeting right now for a fifth step, and I will tell you, I'm, I'm so glad for that, and I try to make that practice with my sponsees, um, there was no relief in the fourth step for me, I've heard some people say they actually did get some relief from it, most people I've heard say they don't. I mean, you're just writing all your bad stuff out. Um, it's, it's not really meant to be a step that's, oh, I just feel so much better. Like, the book never says that you're just going to feel so much better after you do your inventory. You know, that's a hard thing. It's necessary. It's incredibly purposeful and important. We have to have that done to be able to move forward. But there's not a lot of relief in that step itself. So once that's done, I need to get that out. I need to get that going. And she said, we're going to get this done. Um, and I chose to take the entire fist up with my sponsor. I love that the book says you don't have to do it that way. You know, I love that the book says if you want to talk to a clergy person or a friend or if you want to, you know, split it up, however you want to do it, you just have to do it. And that's what my sponsor told me. You don't have to share any of this with me, but you have to share it. You have to tell somebody. Um, for me, the idea of sitting down and doing this once 
was more than enough. Like having like piecemealing all my deepest, darkest secrets all over town sounded just nightmarish. So I was like, no, 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 no. We're doing it all with you, sister. You're it. You got to take all of it. Um, and so we did. I sat down and I told her everything. And there are many reasons that this is important. But for me, there were, there were a couple in particular. One really is accountability. As much as I had spent my whole life avoiding that, you know, like, I have to be accountable. Trying to be accountable to just myself, that wasn't working. That wasn't working because I either alternated between justifying everything I was doing or, like I said, just slaughtering myself on every front. There were, like, there was no in-between. There was no perspective. It was all distorted. It was all, it was just a mess up here. And I had to name it and I had to say it out loud. And I had to have somebody listen and hear it and bear witness to it for me. Um, that's a really important part of this step. That's a really important part of what we do in here. You know, there are a lot of things that we share in this program. There are a lot of people who have had gone through some really incredibly difficult things, who have done some really difficult things. Um, and one of the things that I found is, you know, when we talk about difficult experiences from the past, it doesn't change the past, right? But someone else bearing witness lessens the burden. That's what happens. That's why we share. That's how we share one another. We carry all of our stuff so much more lightly when we carry it together. And that's what happens in this step. The other thing that happened was perspective. You know, my sponsor was able to show me all those things like, wow, so your family was putting all those expectations on you, huh? Yep. Mm -hmm. It's very clear. You can see that, right? She was like, wow, that really sounds like that was a lot of you. That was a lot of like, what? Um, you know, I, how dare you? Um, she could see what I couldn't see. She could also see the things that I was taking responsibility for where she said, Nikki, that had nothing to do with you. Like, do you know what your part in that was? And I'd kind of look at her and she'd just say, you were just there. It's not all your fault. <laughs> like, not everything is your fault. You are not nearly that powerful or important. That was devastating to learn. Um, <laughs> still reeling. But um, that, that was so amazingly helpful. She didn't, it wasn't that she gave me a pass. Right, like part of me was holding out that I would get through this fifth step and she would be like, you have clearly been terribly victimized by life. You've done nothing wrong, I'm so sorry. You know, I'm so sorry that you had to drink because your life was so hard. Um, of course she didn't. When I did something wrong, she said, yeah, that was, that was really bad. We're gonna have to clean that up. <clears throat> but she still had an immense amount of compassion and understanding. She didn't judge, she related wherever she was capable of doing so. Um, she asked me, you know, what are you holding on to? And in spite of my best intentions to keep that one thing a secret, I ended up telling her, you know. So I, I got it all out. I did the whole thing. It was done. On page 75 of the big book are what we generally refer to as the, uh, the fifth step promises. And the fifth step promises say, once we've taken this step, we, withholding nothing, that's important. Once we've taken this step, withholding nothing, we are delighted. We can look the world in the eye. We can be alone at perfect peace and ease. Our fears fall from us. We begin to feel the nearness of our creator. We may have had certain spiritual beliefs, but now we begin to have a spiritual experience. The feeling that the drink problem has disappeared will often come strongly. We feel we are on the broad highway walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. Those are lovely promises. And I will tell you all that they all came true for me eventually. They did not come true for me right after that first fifth step. That was not my experience. The reason I share that with you is to let you know that they did come true. And if it doesn't happen for you, that is not a reflection of you or of the program or of the step, hang in there. I shared that in a meeting once at my home group and one of the men who I truly, truly love said to me when I said I didn't get the fifth step promises right away, he came up to me after the meeting and said, sounds like you didn't do a very thorough fifth step. 
and I caught a resentment so fast I had to do a whole nother four and five on it. Um, I was so mad, I was so mad. And, and I, but I was also, I was mad and I was defensive because I was scared. I was scared he was right. What if he was right? You know, what if I didn't do this right? I worked really hard on this. What if I didn't do this right? And I did, I did another fourth and fifth step on it because I was so upset and I reviewed it with my sponsor. And you know what? I had done a really thorough fifth step. I had, I, I let go of the one thing. I told everything. I did the, did I think of more stuff later? Yeah, but I wasn't withholding it on purpose at the time. I did do a genuine, honest fifth step. And I still didn't get those promises right away. And whenever I share that, when I do the steps and when I speak to other groups, it is always the women who come up to me afterwards and say, I had that experience too. So I share it with you guys, particularly if you've recently done a fifth step or if one is coming up and it, this does not happen for you, it doesn't mean you did anything wrong or that they're not coming. One of the things that I think really got in my way was that deep attachment I had to my feelings of shame. You know, I was just in love with them and they had followed me around for so long, I was not ready to let go of them. My sponsor didn't do anything wrong, but she couldn't make me let go of my shame. That was a first step, but it wasn't everything. You know, um, my, my husband is actually, and I apologize to those of you who have heard this analogy so many times, but I love it and it's one of my favorites. He was one of the people, one of the men that I know who did not have those fifth step promises come true instantaneously. And so, and I was like, wow, me neither. And um, we were talking about it. And he made the analogy that I love, where he said, you know, your four step is like cleaning out your closet, you know, and it's like your, your clutter closet, like the bad one that you don't want anyone to, like Monica's closet on Friends, where you open it and all this stuff comes flying out. You're like, oh my God. You know, it's like cleaning out that one, your bad closet, and pulling all the stuff from that closet right into the middle of your living room and laying it all out. That's your four step, and you're just going, wow, that is a lot of crap. And then your fifth step is like going to get your next door neighbor and bringing her over there and she's looking and going, wow, that is a lot of crap. What are you gonna do with all that, you know? <laughs> and it is in the ninth step. It is in the ninth step where I begin making repairs to the damaged goods, getting rid of the things that are no longer useful and purposeful in my life and getting some order back. That is where the relief came for me. So if it comes a little bit later for you too, it's okay. It's okay, it's coming. Don't let it chase you off from doing this step and from getting the gifts, from getting those promises because when they do come, they are great. Um, they are so worthwhile. Going back to that idea of shame, what I will tell you guys is I heard a speaker, uh, it was not an AA speaker actually, this was at a conference I was at for work and this speaker was talking about the difference between guilt and shame and what he said was so profound to me and so impactful to me and it helped me see things in a different light. What he said was, um, guilt is about something I've done, shame is about who I am. So, how do we relieve guilt? Well, we relieve guilt by making amends. I acknowledge what I've done, I take responsibility, I try to correct the mistake, correct the damage that I've done, and move forward, right? But how do I get rid of shame? because that's about who I am. What do I do for that? And the speaker's point was, shame requires secrecy to survive. So we have that saying in here that our secrets keep us sick. This is why, it's because shame lives in the dark. When we keep things in darkness, that's where my shame flowers and grows. The fifth step was for this alcoholic, the very first time I was exposing all that shame into the light where it cannot continue to survive. But it was so big, y'all. It just took a little more time to have that light shining on it. You know, it took a little more time for me to get comfortable with that and to be willing to let that get smaller and take up a more appropriate size in my life. Um, but I can't keep holding on to it. I can't keep holding on to it because shame requires secrecy to survive. I can't give it that space anymore. Um, when I do, that is when my integrity is threatened. That is when I can no longer be the same person that you see as the person I am on the inside. And that is where that dissonance and that distress begins again for me. So once I did the fifth step, 
you know, was I just like a completely, a person who was just full of integrity and I no longer had any of these poor motives and behaviors? Of course not. I will tell you guys, I had to pray my tail off this morning <laughs> to just ask God to give me the willingness to be honest with y'all. Because whenever I'm in front of people, whether it's in a meeting, whether it's out to dinner with friends, I am still motivated. What I want to do is try to calculate every word out of my mouth to figure out what is going to make you think well of me, what is going to make you think I am either smart or funny or probably the best AA you've ever seen, um, what is going to make you think that I am likable and uh, that you really want to be more like me. Uh, what is going to, I want to calculate every reaction you're going to have ahead of time so that I can be in control. The problem is I am no better at that now than I was back then and I fall on my face with it every single time. But I have to pray for God to give me that ability to give me the courage I need to exhibit integrity, to be honest and vulnerable. Um, I will give you a great example of this at my own expense. So. Um, this is, this is one of my favorite stories because it just shows my character defects like on blast. It is highlighted. So this was a few years ago. So I was not newly sober. I was five years sober when this happened. Not an old timer, I know. I'm still not an old timer. You know, I'm kind of the kid in the rooms. But I was five years sober. It was not my first week. Like I knew better than this. So I was, uh, I was a social worker and I was meeting a new patient um, I was in hospice, so I was meeting a new patient and his family, and it turned out to be the most wonderful little couple I've ever met in my life, this elderly couple, who were, to this day, two of the loveliest people I've ever had the pleasure of knowing. So I sit down with this man who's been recently diagnosed with a terminal illness, and we're talking about you know, his hopes and dreams and what he wants for the end of his life and how we can best support him in reaching those goals, and I'm just getting to know them and hearing their story, and normally my first visit with a patient and their family would be about an hour. I sat there all afternoon. I mean, I spent hours with these people just falling in love. That was absolutely what was happening, is I was just falling in love with them. And I was asking all about them, and they were asking all about me. And one of the things we talk about in end-of-life care, of course, is faith and spirituality, and how do we how do we address that for you? How do we incorporate this into your care? How do we support you and your family uh, in this? And so they're sharing with me about their faith and talking to me about this church, that they are very much integrated in this community that they found that they love and enjoy. And I'm making a lot of affirming statements. You know, it's very clear to them. I'm not hiding the fact that I am a person of faith. Um, and so we're talking and, and uh, the wife turns to me and asks, you know, very casually, what church do you go to? And I told her, St. Mark's in Plano. And they said, oh, we used to go there. And the conversation moved on. Here's the problem. I have driven past St. Mark's <laughs> a lot of times, a lot. I know exactly where it is. I have never been inside of that church, not once. Not once had I been inside that church, but I wanted them to like me. I wanted them to like me. I wanted them to think I was a good person. And I decided that's what I needed to say in that moment, to make them think that I didn't stutter, I didn't hesitate. That lie flew out of my mouth as easily as if they had asked me my name. It came right out, y'all. That was more disturbing to me than anything. I was like, wow, I'm still really good at that, <laughs> turns out. And, and with the differences because of this program and because of the steps within 30 seconds i said i i am so sorry y'all i am so sorry i do not know why i just told you i do know why i just told you that i told them i don't know why i just told you that um i do not go to church at saint mark's i've actually never gone to church saint mark's i haven't been anywhere in a really long time i am a person of faith but i do not attend a church and they looked understandably very confused. Uh, like, first of all, so, so you lied about going to church? And then they were also like, we can't believe she, like, why did you tell us and make it weird? We were perfectly fine being lied to, you know? Because then it was awkward for all of us, you know? I felt weird, they felt weird, nobody knew what to do, where to look. Um, they could not have made any, and 
his wife said, oh, well, why would you lie? And I said, you know, I think I just wanted y'all to like me. And she said, well, not going to church is no reason not like somebody. We already love you. And I felt so much better. Like, they were just so nice. They made, they made a situation that I had tried to make as uncomfortable for everyone as I possibly could, um, as comfortable as they possibly could in spite of me, um, in spite of my machinations to the contrary. So this is not something that necessarily comes easily still. It's just not. Um, I still want to get to be in charge. You know, I, that idea that what other people think of me is none of my business, just I can't quite make that connect. You know, I'm like, what do you mean? It's about me. Of course it's my business. Um, of course I should have a say. I should have a vote. Um, but trying to get my motives right, um, one thing that, like, Stephanie always talks about, that I appreciate and that I've clung on to. Um, like I blamed all my problems on like my relationships with you, with the outside. You know, what this program has taught me is that so much of this stuff, so much of my behavior, so much of my decisions, so much of my ability to have successful relationships is about my relationship with me. Like that's what had to get straight. I was looking for you to make me feel okay about me. I was looking to alcohol to make me feel okay about me. That's ultimately what I wanted. I kept hoping maybe, maybe I wouldn't have to feel okay with me because if you could just do that for me, then we'd be okay. But it never worked, right? It never worked. The hole was never filled. So these principles, as I'm going through and I'm acquiring, that's really what ends up coming out of it is that I start getting okay with me. I start understanding that not only am I never, ever, ever, ever gonna be close to perfect, but that that's really not an appropriate goal. But I can keep trying to move forward. I can keep trying to be better and do better and acknowledge that I'm gonna stumble. Sometimes I'm gonna lie about going to church. You know, stuff's gonna happen. Um, but I don't have to get stuck there. I can fix that. I can go back. I can recognize that dissonance that starts right away because I'm not comfortable sitting in it anymore. Thank God. Thank God. I got so comfortable being uncomfortable, I didn't know any other way to be, you know? But now, when I can address that dissonance in that moment, awkward and uncomfortable though it may be, um, at least I know it's me, you know? At least I know I'm trying. I'm not trying to put on airs. I'm owning up to what I'm doing wrong. I'm trying to move forward. I'm trying to remind myself that if I'm okay with me and I'm okay with my God, my higher power, if he thinks what I'm doing is okay, and I'm pretty sure that I think what I'm doing is okay, then I don't have to be, you know, just shifting in the wind at every moment trying to determine what you think is okay and how to make that happen for you. You know, I don't have to worry about, this is so ridiculous, but I mean, I'm telling y'all, I was like, I would talk to my sponsor early on about, you know, she's like, who do you think is expecting you to be perfect? And it was like, well, first of all, probably everybody, but second of all, um, it, second of all, even if they're not, right, like, if they know who I am, if they know who I am and what I am, like, they'll all run away. You know, they'll all leave. Everybody will leave. If I can just convince them that I'm not, <laughs> uh, that I'm not who I really am, you know, like, so much of this, and I would say, like, I would lie for anything. I would tell you anything. And in my head, I was doing that for you. Right? Because you would probably be devastated if you found out I wasn't perfect. Um, that would probably be heartbreaking to you, and I really wanted to protect you from that. I, I mean, really, when I tell you the way my brain can distort stuff, I am not messing around. It is serious. That was all for me. That was all for me. I am a selfish, self-centered alcoholic. But today, I can do the best to be a selfish and self-centered alcoholic who is trying, who is working a program, who is trying to incorporate these principles and live a life that I can be proud of and that maybe you'll think is okay, maybe you won't. Maybe you'll want it, maybe you won't. But that I get to want what I have, you know? That is the most freedom I could have asked for, that is the most freedom I had gotten since that first night I realized I didn't suck my stomach in, you know? 
and that is enough for me. I, I am so grateful for the gifts of this program, and I am so grateful to all of you. Thank you so much for being here. It has been a privilege and an honor. Thank you.